Welcome, good evening. Welcome to the Red Room. This is a beautiful sunny day in July and I'm excited to talk to you tonight about one of the main components of a great marriage relationship. So these are internal to the marriage relationship and if you remember, you may have downloaded this before, it's my marriage model. Now inside the heart here those are the components within the marriage and they don't exist until two people come together and they create a relationship because there's nothing in there without those two people can both of them contributing to it and sometimes when I see couples come to me in my private practice office there's not much in that relationship um, recently I've been working with um, a few families and this is not uncommon they have a lot of activities in their home. They do many, many things for and with their children. They're great co-parents. They're pretty good friends, but not intimate friends. And their marriage is its two-dimensional. It's not filled up, partly because they know that number one is uh, taking care of their children, and they put that first before their marriage. Now, you and I know kids more than anything need to be born into a, a, a family, a home where they have a mom and dad and the mom and dad have a, a good relationship. I'll never forget learning this, I bet you 20, more than 20 years ago. Never forgotten it, it's simple and you've probably heard it yourself. The best thing a woman can do for her children is to love their father. The best thing a man can do for his children is to love their mother. And one of the things that I've learned, and you probably know this, the best way our children learn anything is what they experience. And they experience more of us, the adults in their lives, than anything else, at least in the first decade or so. And that means that good, bad, or indifferent, whether we like it or not, we end up watching ourselves do what our parents did. When we get to a certain age, we can change that, grow it, um, develop it in the way that we want to. So it's, it's critically important for everything in our world that we have great marriages. We have a great relationship with our beloved. It sets the future. That's why I'm so passionate about teaching this and making it available to all of you out there. And thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in. And please, when you have a question, don't be shy. Type me the question and um, I'll do my very best to give you whatever I've learned about that topic. So thanks for tuning in. Um, tonight is part three of six, talking about what the components are for building that marriage relationship what it is that's rich and important inside that heart in my model. And that's deep friendship. And I may have mentioned before, and you, um, this, this is, sounds simple, and yet it's quite complex, that what we really need if we want a marriage relationship is we're best friends and we're romantic or we're lovers. Um, when you have those things, You've got a marriage relationship or the makings of a marriage relationship. Without those two things, like some couples that end up giving everything they have to parenting their kids, they're no longer best friends because they don't tell each other everything and they're not involved in things as a couple. And they're no longer romantic. They've forgotten their dates. They've forgotten to be a little sexy and a little playful with the wonderful chemistry that a man and a woman can have. And maybe, and this is very tragic, sometimes they've even lost their sex life. So what we want to make sure of is that when you're in an intimate relationship, you are best friends and you have that romantic chemistry. Most healthy people crave that. And the best, of course, romantic chemistry is with your best friend. And the best friendship is with the person that you have the romantic chemistry with. Now I know some people have questions about that sometimes. Um, they're saying, well, 
you know, this is my best friend and it's more important than anything in the world, I might ruin it if we turn it into a romantic relationship. And yeah, that sometimes happens, but usually not. I mean, if you're both available for marriage and or for an intimate relationship, when you find your best friend, that's usually going to be the source of the finest intimate relationship we can have. Ask me any questions about that. I'm so curious. Um, you may have experiences around that, both plus and minus, and um, I'd be happy to comment on whatever it is that you'd like to ask me. And your handout, you can see the link to your handout. It's there on the right-hand side of your screen. And that handout is this. It has four pages. I wanted to give you something that would be very valuable and very useful. So I encourage you to... Um, Download it and print it out for yourself. This covers um, what I can do in this hour in the Red Room at least. The elements of deep friendship. Yes, we want to be friends and with our beloved. Usually it's in our heart and it's in our craving that my man or my woman is my best friend and I am their best friend which means we know each other completely. There are no secrets, no withholds. We trust each other and we love sharing everything. We love hearing everything from our dearest friend in the whole world. And of course, um, women have a best girlfriend or maybe one or two more, and a guy can have a best guy friend. But if you lose your spouse or your beloved as your best friend, and you start having another, if I'm a woman, if I have another man who is my friend or my best friend, I know that something's wrong in my relationship with Jack. That will never happen, not in this relationship. I have the utmost confidence in everything about Jack and me. But in the past, um, I didn't always have the man in my life as my best friend. And sometimes that meant that my journal and me were best friends because I couldn't say everything to him. It wasn't welcome and it wasn't safe for me. Now it is. So I'm living it. I know it. I can, and I can um, happily and, um, how do I say, um, accurately teach this with full integrity. So there are, and I'm quoting um, Dr. Pepper Schwartz. She is a researching authority on relationships whom I admire and trust. I've read her research and her books and I like the way she says it. Um, it always helps when we have the elements that we know we can trust. And Pepper Schwartz is one of those um, scholars and teachers who goes out, does the interviews and, and gets the data. So this little chart on the first page of your handout is um, called Interactional Elements of Deep Friendship. And if we have friendship with our spouse, we want it to be the best friend and therefore the deep friendship of our life. Um, I have put a quote at the top here from John Gottman. And Dr. Gottman is greatly revered by people like me. He is one of the greatest authors and researchers alive about intimate and marital relationships. And notice the greatest, most authoritative and informational person on marriage relationships is alive. And he's, I don't know if he, he may be about my age, about 60, but um, that tells you how young this work is how those of you who are tuned in listening to me tonight, you're learning new information that hasn't been known in the previous generations. So we are so fortunate to be here in these days. Um, jo uh, Dr. Gottman says, the determining factor in whether wives feel satisfied with the sex, romance, and passion in their marriage is by 70% the quality of the couple's friendship. So guys, if you want to please your lady, 
you're going to be there as her best friend. For men, the determining factor is by 70% the quality of the couple's friendship. <laughs> so men and women come from the same planet after all, says Dr. Gottman. So ladies, um, his satisfaction is because you're his best friend. Gentlemen, her satisfaction is because you're her best friend. Isn't that, it's, it's natural, it's healthy, it's ordinary, it's real, and it's the best. So, best friends, communication, and interaction. Um, deep, friend, deep friendship is demanding, loyal, and intimate. Demanding meaning opening up and sharing everything, not withholding, not kind of obfuscating or hiding, but honestly and openly, fearlessly, it, it may be a little, it may feel a little vulnerable, but sharing your truth, sharing what really matters to you, sharing their day. The two know each other very well, they keep lines of communication open, and they are fair and reciprocal with each other, which means it goes back and forth. Reciprocal is if I share um, for five or ten minutes with Jack, he shares for five or ten minutes with me. Or we talk for a half hour about my project today, and then later on we talk for half an hour about his projects. It's reciprocal. We have this um, natural part in us, when we have emotional intelligence at least, where we want it to be fair. We need it to be fair, uh, fair and by golly, we'll make it fair. So if he gives to me, I, I automatically really want to give back to him. And vice versa, of course. So we've got um, six, no, seven elements of interactional deep friendship. And this is the front page of the download that you have right there beside the Red Room. And welcome. I can see somebody just tuned in. I don't know who you are, but we've got, it's nice to, I be, uh, when I can see that new people um, chime in on with us. Okay, so the first element of deep friendship is understanding with tolerance and respect. So understand your, pro, your spouse's preferences. You want to know what they love, what they like, what they don't like, because Obviously, if you love somebody, you want all the good that they want. Differences are manageable because of mutual respect. We're not hostile with each other. We're not against each other or enemies or um, in debate or argument. We want to know and we want to respect how our beloved is. Share vulnerabilities without fear that it will be revealed or used against them. That means understanding good boundaries, privacy. There are things that we say to each other that ought not to be known by anyone else. That's private business. That's very personal and intimate and close. And we need to be able to trust each other that that's just between you and me. Um, so understanding with tolerance and with respect, which means we tolerate any differences that we have. And tolerance really and truly is a virtue. And virtues aren't innate. They are learned and practiced and developed. Um, let's see here. <laughs> I'm upset. I even missed the first 11 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Me too. I missed the first five minutes. Isn't Heather great? Uh, yes, I look forward to this every week. You, oh, I have fans. Thank you so much for saying that in type. <laughs> anyway, you can follow right along. Um, just download the hand handout and print it out, and you'll see what I was talking about in general. Um, so tolerance is saying you have a differing opinion from me, and tolerance is I tolerate that, and I want to tolerate that with equanimity and with generosity. Um, Maybe Jack likes, really, really likes um, having, well, we've, we've got one that everybody who knows us knows about this one. He doesn't like animals in the house. Now, he's, he's done all of his share about having animals in the house. 
And I am a cat nut. I don't have a cat because I tolerate our differences. If he's not comfortable with animals in the house, even though I adore cats, that's a low priority for me because he's number one in my life. Now get this. He, um, we were on our way to Starbucks in the car together one morning. And he said, you know, I've been thinking about your Christmas present. Really? Yeah, I've been thinking about your Christmas present. And you're not going to believe what I'm going to say. Sweetie, I'll believe you. I, you know, I know, you know, you don't lie. You always tell me um, what you're really thinking. He said, well, you're not going to believe this. And you know what he said? He said, I've decided I'll be okay with cats in the house. Now, greater love hath no jack than to be okay with cats in the house. So that's him after nine years of marriage uh, loving me to the point where he's considering how to love Heather even better and realizing that that's one thing that he could tolerate for me. Not because he would ever want it, but because he loves so, it so much and he knows that that's something that I like, he will tolerate that. Now, you and I know he might end up liking cats someday, but I'll leave that for the future. And um, so it took the pressure off of that. I'm not urgent to have a cat or cats right now. I tell him, you know, wait until I'm about 75 or thereabouts and I'll have the, um, the craving for that. But he gave me a great gift of love when he said that he could tolerate that difference for me, out of love for me. Um, there are other things that I tolerate for him, but I'm going to go on. I could talk about that as well, and I have talked that, about that in other times. <laughs> and then respect, which means if we have differences, we want to respect those differences and we also want to respect when each of us shares something that's vulnerable and private and not talk about it at a party not talk about it when we're frustrated in front of other people that that's sacred and it's just between the two of us and it's it really is troubling um, to most of us if we slip and reveal one of those things and then want to apologize but you want to be careful and find out um, where the edges are of what your spouse feels comfortable with sharing about um, the things that you talk about personally. Okay, the next sec section is shared worlds. And this is the one that some couples who are great co-parents, how they, um, they're, they have difficulty here. Because their shared world may be going to the football games with their kids. But they need a shared world that's intimate between the two of them. Um, interest in each other's day to share their experiences, share work or business, share excitement and pleasure such as hobbies. So when a couple comes to me and they're in trouble, um, I want to know what worlds might possibly be available for them to share. And some couples you know, maybe they've been in a relationship since they were in their 20s or um, early 20s, and they've grown and they've changed. They've developed their personality and their identity, and he's going off in this direction, and he has a set of friends over there. You know, for example, he might like to play golf, and he goes on golf trips. And she has a, a group of friends, and she goes over here. Um, they might like to go to art galleries. And they're both very... Um, tolerant and um, encouraging of each other. You go off with your guys and play golf. You go off with your girls and go to the art galleries. But if they do too much of that, then in essence they've lost their best friendship. They end up being best friends, him with his guy friends and her with her girlfriends. And they spend more time away from each other than with each other. That's when we need to develop those shared worlds. Sometimes it's very interesting to me even though they're, you know, they've been together for a long time, they're great parents, have a good family, they don't have much that they really like in common. And that says to me, we've got to find something, and we need to put a lot of energy into that and be creative with it. Uh, I'll never forget a family, a couple, where 
the only thing they had in common was they liked, um, I just lost my monitor for a second, uh, they liked camping. And I thought, thank goodness, because you and I know camping can have many forms. It can last a lifetime. The kids can either go or not. There's beautiful nature all over the world. So when we discovered that that was a mutual interest, a shared interest with the two of them, bingo. They hadn't been camping in 10 years. And so to begin to nourish their, their um, deep friendship, they planned a camping trip. Okay, the ability to negotiate differences. Negotiate differences. Isn't that a nice way of putting it? Where it's not, um, um, I, I really don't like the word compromise. Compromise always says to me that somebody's got to give up something. Somebody's got to sacrifice. And I don't think in a real marriage we have that feeling. You know, if, if I want to negotiate something, and it's for the two of us, it's for our life, the life that I want to build together with Jack, I don't feel like I'm compromising anything by moving my focus from that over to this because we're going to move on to something that's important to, the, to both of us. Um, however, if it's something that's really important to one person and there's a real difference there, then the two of them need to find out a way to negotiate where that's part of the style of their marriage, it's part of the style of their life, and they like it. So that it's negotiated and it's kind of like this is the suit we wear as a couple. Um, it's, um, the detail on this is commitment to always work it out, especially in an argument. Don't pull rank, shut each other out, get derisive, or presume to have more than the fair share of time. And that's, to me, being adult. Um, thinking about the other person first and not being selfish, self-centered, and needy. And um, no matter what it is, wanting to figure it out, wanting to solve the problem. And that presupposes we have the emotional intelligence to no longer use emotional manipulation or tantrums to try and get our way. Where we're genuinely so respectful and loving of the other person that we'll say, okay, let's figure, out, let's figure this one out. You know, let's talk about it for a few weeks or go back and forth about it and see what we come up with. No rush, no hurry, no pressure. Um, I love you, you love me. And um, here's something for us to talk about. You know, sometimes that topic is about having children where a couple have been together for some years. They're younger, so it's not really a top of the list on their agenda to figure out how and what they want to do. And then it's, it, one or the other of them brings it up and it becomes a dialogue. And sometimes it's quite threatening and scary to one of the people. And um, when couples bring that to me, this ability to negotiate differences with, with having children, because some, sometimes one of them, it, then when they really start thinking about it, they get scared. And what we do is we listen to both people equally. And I list on the flip chart all the pluses and all the minuses that both people have very intelligently about having children, what they're going to gain and what they really want, what excites them, and what they're scared of, or what they're, they're, they know they're going to lose, or how it's going to change, so that it becomes very realistic. And then we go through it one piece at a time, saying, well, yeah, this is true. What do you think about it? Is, is this enough to say, no, we're not going to have kids? Or on second thought, you know, is this... What's your higher value? Loving this person and having a family or being scared um, you know, that you're, you're never going to be just the two of you again. So the ability to no negotiate your differences and negotiations happen between adults who are respectful and intelligent and want, want the enjoyment of working together with each other about something that's important. Okay, that's three of the um, seven. So we've talked about understanding with tolerance and respect, shared worlds, the ability to negotiate differences. Number four, the ability to be private and separate. 
ah, which means not needy. That means um, not having to have the other person around to feel comfortable. So let's read the detail here. Um, no pressure to be exactly alike. Collaboration requires privacy as well as public sharing. Take turns giving advice, thinking of things to do, being the strong or the faltering one. The ability to be private and separate. Private in terms of this is what we do in private and, um, and separate and we don't share this in public. And these are the things that are we're free and easy about sharing with friends or in, in social activities. And when, when times are tough, and this is kind of a rule of thumb that comes along, where times will be tough and we can't predict that much of the time. Although, like for example, when you have uh, a child or if you have like twins or triplets, we know that there are going to be some unusual stressors. And the man and the woman will have different types of stressors. So when you want to be in agreement that when one, one person is faltering and maybe tired or stressed, the other one holds it for them. And then when the roles are reversed, the other person is tired or stressed, the other one holds it for them. It's very, very hard in a relationship when I have couples come to see me and they're both faltering or they're both stressed. You know, for example, he's lost his job and he can't find work for a year and her dad, who she's very close to, passes away. And they're both just bearing up under the weight of grief and loss. And um, at that point, taking care of each other is important, but it's also really important that if you're the husband, you make sure that you get support for her so she connects with her girlfriends and her, um, her mom or somebody who is a dear friend and a mentor. And if it's your husband, you want to make sure that he has time with the guys or the, the downtime, the cave time, the quiet time he needs to just recharge. One of the things that um, I want to remind you of, making love and having a happy sex life is, forgive me, but it is the ultimate panacea. And that if, when you're stressed or you're grieving or whatever, if you maintain your sexual connection and your romantic relationship, it's, it's a renewal and a privacy and an intimacy that you have just for the two of you. And sometimes that can make all the difference, helping each other through adversity in a tough time. So when you get to a place where it's really tough, make sure that you take the time and Use the energy to keep your love life alive. Chime in when you've got any questions or feedback or curiosity. I'm always interested in what you're thinking and, and um, what you need clarification about. Okay. Um, number five is reconceptualizing affection. Hmm. What's that? Well... We want to use the five love languages. Now, affection in the ordinary world, you know, it's affectionate families who hug each other, who kiss each other on the cheek and smile and put their arm around, um, that kind of affection. Or rough, some families are rough and tumble, um, uh, whatever it is that is your style and your family to be affectionate. Now, once you get married, we want to reconceptualize affection where we're sensitive to each other's love languages. And most of us have encountered the book on the five love languages. I am so endlessly grateful to Gary Chapman for writing that book for us all. And um, you can read it or you can just know about the five love languages and and prioritize them. When you're an adult, you pretty well know um, of the five love languages, which one is your top, which one is your number two. And uh, like I told somebody recently, you need to have your partner's top two love languages written on your forehead. That's the number one thing in the world is to love. 
And if you've got some time or energy to do it, you want to do it in their love language. So the five love languages are spending quality time together, having romantic or affectionate touch with each other, um, words of affirmation, words of love, words of admiration, words of kindness, gifts, little gifts, tiny gifts, big gifts, surprise gifts, ritual gifts. Um, uh, I, I knew a man once who had a personal relationship, well, professional personal relationship, with the florist on the way home from work because his wife never got over the thrill of him bringing her flowers every Friday. And that was one of the rituals that was part of the design of the style of their marriage and that he brought her flowers every Friday. And so gifts, the, the gift of flowers for her was one of her main love languages. And then acts of service. Uh, I was just uh, working with a couple and she said when she just can't get on top of a 16 foot ladder and change a light bulb in the vaulted ceiling. And that when he does that for her, it makes her feel loved. Um, some people are completely thrilled by acts of service. It means so much to them. Others, usually the independent ones of us, say, well, I would rather have um, a card with something written on it, or I'd rather spend quality time doing something. So you want to reconceptualize affection for this, your primary and your most precious relationship, so that how you're expressing affection gets the message across um, completely and purely and in the best and most intense way that I love you. Um, question, I think my boyfriend's love languages are all over the map. Should I ask him directly? Of course you should. <laughs> um, there's an old concept about um, you don't want to ask. You kind of feel shy or embarrassed. But that presupposes what in marriage counseling we call mind reading. And mind reading usually doesn't work very well. We usually have a different view, even if we're different genders, we're going to have a different view. So you want to ask directly because you don't want to shoot yourself in a foot or waste your time. You want to know, I want to know the real stuff. I want to know what you really love and like because that's what I'm here for. I'm here to love you. So his love languages may be all over the map. And one of the things that's very easy to do, and people don't think about this, um, is ask them to rate it from 1 to 10. So he says, well, I like when you um, cook spaghetti for me. And so you say, oh, really? So 0 to 10, how many points do I get for cooking spaghetti? And he'll say, 6. Oh, OK, cool. Well, it's not a 10, so there's something else that's even better than that. But if it's a 6, that's good, you know? It's above 5. Now, if you only get a 2 or a 3, I'd want to go on to find the 8s, 9s, and 10s, right? So, um, his, uh, what do you, what do you, give me a little more clue about his love languages are all over the map, because we might see a pattern in there. Okay. Collegiality. Hmm. That's a word that we don't usually associate with the deep friendship. Um, mutual excellence. Hmm. Each good person makes the other person look better and feel stronger. Hmm. Division of labor is on ability and desire rather than on authority and tradition. This requires honesty. Not being nice, not withholding, not manipulating, being, being safe enough with each other to be completely honest about what, like in division of labor, what makes you feel grateful to each other. Not that, well, you have to do that because it's your role to do that. And I don't like to do that. Well, um, in the beginning of a relationship and as a relationship is 
revitalized and shaped. You want to have a discussion about division of labor. You know, if um, somebody has to take out the garbage, right? <laughs> Unless you have help. <laughs> um, and you want to find out, like for me, taking out the garbage is like, well, it's kind of like a, it's okay, I can do that. But for Jack, taking out the garbage is an act of service, and he wants to do it because he wants to take care of me. So I know when he does that, it's um, it's him saying, I'm responsible for this, and I love you. I don't want you to do it. And you know what he says to me quite often? He says, I don't want you to wait on me hand and foot. It, that old concept that sometimes was unequal or even today, when you find couples where one of the order one of them orders the other one around, or is too selfish. So, um, collegiality, equality, colleagues are peers or equals, and um, Pepper Schwartz was the first one to write about peer marriage because we've been thinking about that: men and women being e different, very different, but being equally valuable. So mutual excellence, that you know that it can be pretty irritating when one person loves organizing and order, cleanliness, and elegant beauty. And the other one, well, I really don't care, and they leave their stuff lying around. That's going to be an irritation. What, what you want to do is enter into a conversation where um, you establish your um, collegiality in that where um, you have a, a sense of mutual excellence, where one comes to the other, not out of sacrifice, but out of devotion to their relationship. Um, this uh, lady says, well, I've heard of this concept before, but none of the love languages seems to make any difference. Hmm. Maybe it makes a difference on his side, but I can't tell. Ah, well. Then if you can't tell, um, he's not communicating and not giving you appreciation or thanks or notice that you've done anything. And perhaps he needs to be aware that um, he needs to communicate better. And one of the ways you can figure that out is um, you do something for him and you say, I, I really like doing this for you. Did, did you like it? And it will say, yeah. And you say, zero to ten. Um, how good did that make you feel? And they say, well, about four. Oh, well, then it wasn't that important to you. Have I done something else? Is there something else that was more important to you? You want to figure it out. You want to be very clear and open and honest with each other about that. Because the goal of a relationship is that you feel loved. And you want to make the other one, the other person, feel loved. I feel he's distracted by lots of things in life other than me, but I don't want to be selfish. Hmm, that's not uncommon, is it? And sometimes when we get busy, especially with a career, um, big responsibilities we're shouldering, um, changes we're managing that take a lot of our energy, sometimes it's a relief just to come home and not have to do anything, not have to talk and just not have much energy left over. And um, especially with couples who both work and have children, that's not uncommon, where they just flat out don't have the energy to um, extend toward each other. Now, one of the things that you and I know, um, take for example working out, that you're tired, um, come home from work, and um, you just don't have the energy, don't feel like going to work out. But if you go work out, you end up feeling better and having more energy. So the same thing with a relationship. If you have just that little bit that you can give and you know that what you're giving is the thing that really makes a difference, you've got the energy to do that. So um, if he's distracted by other, lots of things, that means there are things he, lots of things he cares about, and we really respect that. Yes, you don't want to be selfish, but at the same time, you don't want to lose the bond. And um, have you said that to him? 
You say, I know that you're distracted by all kinds of things, and I don't want to be selfish, but I'm wondering, or and I'm wondering, either way, um, what it is that um, works for you in a relationship and in terms of what you need from me. So have that conversation in a quiet moment with him and just see what he thinks. Or send him a, a note or an email. Um, sounds to me like you need a little more information from him. And maybe he's in a place where he's under so much pressure to do things and he's distracted by those things that he just needs your support while to hang in there while he's getting those things completed or accomplished. I love the way Jack handles that. He always says, now, um, I, I hope you can be patient with me. I'm starting on this project, and you're not going to see me all day long. And um, it feels very respectful of him to do that. And, of course, I don't mind at all, because then I get to write and edit and do things that I like to do, too. And then I'm, I'm happy to see him when he comes back. And I'm not feeling deprived or ignored. But you need to be able to find that balance in your relationship. Um, you get it. He's got incredible pressure right now. So I shouldn't worry? No. I would say that this is a time when he needs your unconditional love. If he's got lots of pressure on him, and it's, you know, it's reputable pressure probably at work where he's got a big new project or a promotion or whatever, um, he needs your support. And he needs to know that you're not over here singing. He's ignoring me, and I'm frustrated. And, well, if he's not going to spend time with me, then I'm going to go with my girlfriend's. That kind of immature behavior. Um, what he needs, and what we all need, is when we have big projects that we need to work on and big responsibilities that take a lot of our time and our energy, that we, our partner is mature enough and strong enough to handle that so that when we come back um, they're happy to see us and I love the the story that I typically use where I think about those families where one or the other has to travel a lot it may be a person in the military it may be a person who works on boats or ships or airplanes where they their work forces them to travel and they're gone for days or weeks even and what they need in a relationship is the person they come home to to be independent and happy to do lots of things by themselves and when their beloved comes home they greet them with joy and delight and say I missed you welcome home not with but it's like this time is too long you can't leave me like this I need you and I don't do well without you they don't need that they need an adult that can handle it unless they're avoiding you and then that, that's a whole other problem right let's see here I still think I could do better so don't want to grill him about love language you don't have to grill him just say sweetie I want to do the, the things that make you feel good grill is too strong of a word yeah I get the idea however um, the way I would put it um, is when you get together, you say, um, now, I'm mentoring you here a little bit with what we call cushion statements. And cushion statements are how we handle um, communicating complaints with a request for change. And um, I talked about cushion statements earlier, a few months ago. Um, so you want to cushion it. And, you, and for example, you say, um, I know that we have very little time together, and I really prize that time. And I'm fine with only a little bit. You know, I think we do great. Um, and I really would like to know what your priority is, when you can come up for air, when you're tired, or when you want to see me. I want to make sure that we spend, whatever time we spend together is really high quality. So um, I'm thinking it might be this, or this, or this. Am I on track here? Kind of communicating like that. You're not grilling him. You're expressing love and asking for his um, uh, his input on it. Um, so that that way of expressing it, not saying, 
well, what do you want me to do? Now, being more artful, using more terms, um, affirming what you're doing, which means talking about the whole concept, which may take eight or ten sentences rather than just saying, what do you like best? Be more artful and be more expressive of all of the intentions in a positive way underneath that particular topic. Cool. She says, okay, that helps. Good. Um, if you want, email me. I'm going to type this here. Email me and uh, I'll send you my, um, I think it's about four pages on the use of cushion statements. Because um, that's what I was um, just modeling for you. Cushion statements ask me for the handout. There you go. And it give you give you some more um, examples of how that works. Cushion statements typically are around a complaint with a request for change. You know when you have to handle something that's difficult. But cushion statements are always also good around something that's really Mm, really important and really sacred and you want to make sure that you're really completely honoring the description of what you want to say. Okay, so division of labor is on ability and desire rather than authority and tradition. Requires honesty. Yeah. Honesty about what you like to do and what would you would like to have done and to handle whatever the other person says back so that you're kind of in that negotiation. And then the seventh part of deep friendship, the interactional elements, is togetherness. Similar pleasures shared such as gardening, cooking, dancing, sports, camping, the arts, hiking, etc., but also with others, socially and with friends. So when a couple is um, wanting to rejuvenate their relationship or they're now having a pretty hard time and they've lost their friendship. The very first thing I want them to do is to have some fun. Have fun and smile. Doing something that makes you happy, makes you laugh. And sometimes it's a lot easier to kind of move into that if you're doing it with a couple, with another um, couple that love each other, healthy, have a good time, and they have some hobbies maybe similar to yours. So, for example, if the two of you play golf, you want to find another couple that plays golf. Um, if you um, like gardening, maybe um, go out to dinner with another couple that likes gardening and talk about what you're going to do in the next season. Or go, go on a field trip to one of those great, you know, huge professional nurseries. So whatever it is that you have as a shared interest, take it to the next level. Um, you know, not just going down to Callaway's if it's gardening. Researching and finding, I know, um, I heard a story that one couple told me a few years ago. They loved gardening. And um, they found this kind of, um, um, how do I say it, country, kind of like homey place and this couple, their business was raising antique roses. And they sold them. Um, and, and the couple that were my clients drove, it was a, um, I think it was a day and a half trip. They had to drive so far that they stayed overnight at a bed and breakfast somewhere, which is pretty cool too, because that's kind of homey and cozy and intimate. So they, they drove down to where this farm was out in the country and um, this couple who has this business were they were absolutely fascinated by the number and the beauty of all of these old roses that had been they'd rescued from like old deserted farmsteads and such and then had um, been growing them and grafting them so that's just an example of let's take it to another level if you've got gardening these people liked roses Instead of just going down to Callaway's, they made it a day trip. And of course, you know, they're telling me the story and other people as well. What have I got here? ASD. What's that? ASD. Ask? <laughs> 
Um, sorry, just trying to log in. <laughs> That's okay. Welcome. Um, you've only got 10 minutes left, bless your heart. <laughs> um, we've been talking about the seven components of interactional elements for deep friendship. So the other part of this handout that I put up there for you to download tonight has to do with intimate communication. And this is up there. I have lots more materials on it, but just on one page, this is kind of an overview and um, so that you focus, you choose only one agenda item when you're going to communicate about something intimate that may be sensitive or of concern or that you really need to uh, get clear about. Explore it and clarify it. Each person takes a turn as the speaker and then the other one is the listener, so it's fair, back and forth. A statement of viewpoint with mirroring where you mirror the other person um, saying, is this, is this how, I think, I think I understand you, am I getting it? This is what you were saying? And brainstorming, sometimes we forget to brainstorm and just, I know Jack always, he's such a doer, he's such a smart guy and he's got all these ideas. When we're talking about stuff, he says, okay, this is how we can do it. And I'm saying, no, 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 I don't want to decide how we're going to do it. I want to brainstorm some more. I want more dreams, I want more images, I want more ideas. So I've had to train him that I really like to brainstorm. I'm not asking him to put this on his to-do list. And then the last one, just a little paragraph on problem solving. But um, this quote on this page is so fabulous. You know I've complained before, but quotes about marriage are often so derogatory. But this is a great one, and this is from... Thornton Wilder, the great playwright, and his play called The Skin of Our Teeth. And he says, I didn't marry you because you were perfect. I didn't even marry you because I loved you. I married you because you gave me a promise. That promise made up for your faults, and the promise I gave you made up for mine. Two imperfect people got married, and it was the promise that made the marriage. And when our children were growing up, it wasn't a house that protected them, and it wasn't our love that protected them. It was that promise. Which says about trust and commitment, right? Now, we know that they wouldn't have gotten married had they not loved each other. But he's, he's talking about um, when we're mature and we get married, we know each other's foibles and faults. And... Um, we know we're not perfect, and yet we love each other. And we make a promise. When we make that promise, it's so big and so sacred that no matter what tr troubles life throws us, that promise keeps us strong together, keeps us strongly together. And it protects our kids because we don't get a divorce. We don't abandon them. And when it gets tough, we hang on and do the work through it. You know, the statistic is that a couple that considers divorce, if they hang in there and put their energy into their marriage, after five years, only 12% of them get a divorce. And the rest of them say they're happy or very happy. So this is Thornton Wilder talking about that promise and how it holds us through even when we're in the tough times and we doubt ourselves. We stick to that commitment. I, I love that quote. It's a grown-up quote. Let's see here. Somebody says something. I was late, but I know I'll learn something. <laughs> Yay! I want you to. Um, we, uh, we need to learn to be friends again. Between stress, putting full attention on our two-year-old son and my husband's ADD, we have really grown apart. That's so natural. And those things that you're talking about are it's just life, isn't it? And you know what? When you're, when you're adults and when you see this and you haven't left it for too long, um, it's, it's kind of a lovely thing. And goodness knows it's a wonderful thing for your kids to experience. When you notice that it's been slipping apart and you decide, you make a decision volitionally to bring yourselves closer, closer together. That friendship really is talking. I mean, honest to goodness, it's talking. 
And um, it, the best thing in the world is for a child to see that we make mistakes and then we change and make it better. Then they get the lesson very early in life that we all need to have. I can make a mistake and it can just kind of go into a place where I'm really sad or I'm chagrined or I'm frustrated and then I can bring it back. And when we're adults, we can bring it back at a higher level, you know, like I was talking about. And instead of just going to Callaway's, that couple went to that antique rose garden um, hours and hours away. You take it, adults know how to plan. They know higher quality things are there for them and they schedule those things. They, they decide we're gonna do this. So for example, if you've started to grow apart with all the stress and everything, the fastest thing you can do is to find another couple that's healthy and happy and funny and go out to dinner with them or, or go dancing with them or go to Dave and Buster's with them just to let loose, relax, laugh and have fun. Or maybe you really do need to make sh sure you trust somebody to take your child and you take a night off and um, go somewhere pretty or quiet or fun. And when you're adults, when you're intelligent and you know what you're doing, um, pick something not just ordinary. Go a little above and beyond. You know, like maybe you go to a movie, but then mm, you go to a hotel afterwards, a nice hotel. Or you just go to a hotel and you have a, an adult beverage and you hang out like um, you did when you were single and just talk in a beautiful, quiet atmosphere. I love hotels because oftentimes you'll find a place. Oh, I'll give you this tip. Jack and I found this wonderful place to have a drink out in the open air with quiet. It's the, um, the mansion restaurant on the patio. So that's, that's one thing we just discovered recently. If you have any ideas like that that you've discovered for the two of you as a couple, email me, tell me about them. I want to know them and I want to share them with um, everyone. Um, love that quote, gives me hope on marriage. Doesn't it? Marriage is the most fabulous, powerful thing. And uh, it handles our humanity when you find the right one, you know? Um, and so then, this is the other piece, especially um, the person who just said that we lean, need to learn to be friends again. The last two pages of the handout are golden. They're really and truly golden. It's um, daily dialogue for couples, and the last page is from me to you, this little thing to cut out and put in your pocket or your purse or your wallet. And this is um, a little pattern um, that guarantees the two of you talk into your best friendship again. And some couples, when they start doing this, I mean, when they're really in trouble, they do it, by golly, they do it. <laughs> and I've had some couples tell me um, how powerful it is, how they make it their own, and how they don't ever want to stop doing it because it feels so good and it helps them connect in, in, the, in the, the best, the deepest way for the deep friendship that we need in our marriages. Um, there are five things on this daily dialogue, I call it, that you want to go through. Some couples change it, but try to stay true to it for at least three weeks before you shift it because you'll never know what it feels like until you actually do it. You can do it on the phone, you can do it pillow talk at night or in the morning, you can do it uh, over lunch, um, you can do it over a glass of wine when somebody comes home from work, however it is that it fits for your marriage, your, your designer style of marriage. So first of all, you start with the good stuff that kind of makes you glow. Number one, appreciations. and. One of you appreciates the other one, usually for something very specific, very concrete. You know, like, I really appreciated how, you know, when you took me out to dinner last night, you came around and you opened the car door for me and then closed it for me. I know it was a little thing, but it makes me think about what a gentleman I married and how you do pay attention to me and how 
I notice other women, their husbands don't do that or their boyfriends don't do that, and you do it. And I admire that about you, dear. So see, that's a very specific example of what he did that made her feel like a lady and made her feel loved. If you can get very specific like that, it's more powerful. Um, number two, wishes, hopes, and dreams. And this is the part where I was telling you, I like to brainstorm. I like to dream. I like to have new ideas. And Jack is usually wanting, let's, let's plan something, let's get it done. I want, he's a man of action. But I want wishes, hopes, and dreams that I can kind of play with and morph and see how they unfold or expand or how they fit into my day or my life. So wishes, hopes, and dreams can be anything. Can be for next week, how our party's going to turn out, or for when we retire, or for how we want to remodel our house. Any kind of wishes, hopes, and dreams. Or what we want to, what we're hoping for. We've got a teenager that's acting out, and we're trying to hold it strong. And my wish and hope and dream is, dream is, is this teenager gets to the place where they're no longer angry and feeling like it's not fair. Anything, wishes, hopes, and dreams. Um, number three, new information. And goodness knows there's new information about all different kinds of things, and that's what best friends share. So this is like a little formula to make sure that you're talking like best friends. Um, new information like, oh, somebody called me and they want to have dinner with us on Friday. Does that fit in your calendar? Or new information, um, Jennifer brought her report card home and one of her classes is slipping. I think we need to help her figure out how to keep herself um, on track with that class. And then we've got uh, four out of five puzzles. Now puzzles can be, you know, I'm confused about this, I don't know how I'm going to figure it out, or this is a puzzle, you know, I heard this and it made me feel bad. Somebody said that you said such and so, or somebody said they saw you doing such and so, and you know, I, I didn't want to um, confront you or anything, but it's a puzzle, Can and, and I know you can tell me what's going on there. Or puzzle. Should I um, take my vacation um, around the holidays? Or what do you think? Should we take a vacation without the kids? That kind of thing. Or do you think so-and-so is using drugs? And what are we going to do? It can be any kind of a puzzle. And that invites dialogue. It, it invites negotiation or working together or confidences or confiding. And then the fifth one, and this guarantees that you keep the slate clean. Complaint with a request for change. And you remember, I want you to remember this. The number one predictor of divorce or the end of a relationship is avoidance of conflict. That means that when we've got a tough spot, when we've got a rough spot, when we've got a difficulty, when we have a hurt, when we have something that's not nice, we don't want to avoid it. And this is the place where it belongs. And if we do this every day, nothing builds up. Nothing gets that big. It's a complaint with a request for change. And notice a complaint is saying, you know, I'm, this is my complaint. And you keep it to your, about your own, um, your own thoughts and feelings. I'm worried that such and so and what you really want to use is cushion statements around this as well. And, you know, um, like this lady said here, we need to learn to be friends again. And so she, this is her complaint. Um, between stress, putting full attention on our two-year-old son and my husband's ADD, we've really grown apart. This is her complaint. And can you see it comes from a loving heart and a caring concern. And then the next thing is a request for change. So your request for change is saying, um, what can we do to um, reconnect? What we can we can do that um, helps us get closer to each other and help us talk better and be connected again? So that's a perfect complaint with a request for change. And if we do it with this, just this little tiny card, that reminds us to do these five things, to just to talk about them every day, it guarantees that those complaints don't get 
like molehills built into mountains and that they're manageable and we just clean the slate every day. That allows us to keep a relationship healthy, happy, and to keep that deep friendship that is one of the most important components of a great intimate relationship. So as I said in the very beginning of the Red Room tonight, a marriage relationship, an intimate relationship, really is founded on two things, being best friends and being romantic. So tonight we talked about the interactional elements of a being best friends, of deep friendship. We want to have that more than anything. And from my viewpoint of what I know and all the stories that I've heard, being best friends is the very best start to an intimate relationship which is why a whole lot of those online relationships and telephone relationships um, create friendship by talking before the two people ever get together. And that's, a, that's the best kind of a start. So, any questions before I sign off and uh, close the Red Room for tonight? Um, thank you for tuning in. Um, it's absolutely stunning for me to know that I have fans. And I, I love the things that you ask me, the things that you say, and that you take the time to tune in and be here with me. As you can tell, I'm passionate about this subject. I always will be, and I'm always learning more. I hope that it makes a difference and helps you have the great fun and goodness and meaning of a great relationship. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being my fan. And tonight, I'll wish you good night from the red, the red Room, and we'll talk next week on the fourth component of the six of having a great marriage relationship. Good night, everyone, from the Red Room. See you next week. Same time, same place. <laughs> Take care.